Chapter One of The Widow Married, a sequel to The Widow Barnaby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Céline Major. The Widow Married, a sequel to The Widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. Chapter One An incomplete narrative resumed. An unexpected blessing. Preparations for happiness the philosophy of resemblance all persons tolerably well read in biography are aware that the amiable mrs barnaby ci devant miss martha compton of silverton after having lost her second husband the rev mr o'donagough from the effects of an unfortunate accident which occurred to him near sydney in new south wales bestowed her still extremely fair hand on her former friend and favourite major allen but the events which followed these third espousals though unquestionably of as much general interest as any which preceded them have never yet been given to the public with that careful attention to the truth of history which they deserve and it is to remedy this obvious defect in english literature that the present narrative has been composed the existence of mrs barnaby this name is once more used as the one by which our heroine has hitherto been best known the existence of mrs barnaby up to the hour in which she pledged her vows to major allen before the altar of the principal church in sydney had on the whole been a very happy one she had in fact very keenly enjoyed many things which persons less fortunately constituted might have considered as misfortunes and to the amiable and well-disposed reader a continuation of the history of such a mind can hardly fail of being useful as an encouragement and example mrs o'donagough on the day she married major allen was exactly thirty-eight years of age at least she only wanted two days of it and it is possible that her wish to enhance the festivity of every scene in which she was engaged might have led her to name her birthday as that on which her third wedding should take place had it not been that a sort of dislike which she had taken while still martha compton of silverton to the unnecessary dragging forth the date of the day and hour at which people were born still continued she therefore said nothing at all about her birthday but prepared for the solemn ceremony with as much tender emotion and as delicate a bloom as when she first pledged her virgin troth to mr barnaby born under a happy star a pleasure yet awaited mrs major allen the want of which she had often lamented and of which her hopes had long since withered and faded till at length they assumed the worn-out aspect of despair but in due time after her third marriage mrs allen communicated to the major the delightful intelligence that he was likely to become a father major allen behaved exceedingly well on the occasion professing his entire satisfaction at the news and adding with newly awakened paternal forethought if that is the case mrs allen we must mind our hits as to money matters and take care that our little evening card parties answer to this mrs major allen had not the slightest objection but how powerful is maternal feeling in a woman's heart though she failed not to render her little sydney soirees as attractive as ever though she walked about the room and behind the card-players as usual never forgetting a single instruction given to her by her ingenious husband notwithstanding she did all this her heart was almost wholly in her work-basket it was really beautiful to watch the development of a mother's feelings in a heart which had never yet been awakened to them for instance mrs major allen had never shown herself in any country particularly fond of poor people but now she never saw a woman in her own interesting situation without feeling her heart or at any rate her attention drawn towards her and many a question did she ask and many a copper coin did she bestow in consequence of this most amiable species of solicitude during the first months of her residence at sydney she had not perhaps chosen her intimates among the most domestic ladies but now the case was entirely altered there was an excellent woman a mrs sheepshanks the wife of an attorney enjoying great business in the town who had more little children than any other lady in it and with her mrs major allen now sought to form an intimacy of the most familiar kind she delighted in nothing so much as stepping in to call upon her as soon as breakfast was over and entering with her even while her nursery avocations rendered everything like regular conversation impossible into a sort of zigzag intercourse between saying and doing that to any one less delightfully alive to the innocent attractions of little children must have appeared exceedingly tiresome mrs sheepshanks poor woman like all the other ladies in the settlement found it very difficult not to say impossible to keep any decent servant in her family 
the few young women who deserved the epithet getting married themselves with such certain rapidity as to give every reason to suppose that mr hood's interesting anecdote of an offer of marriage being made through a speaking trumpet to a vessel approaching the coast with young ladies aboard must have been founded strictly on fact at the time mrs sheepshanks and her little family took such hold on the affections of mrs major allen the only attendant the attorney's lady had to assist her in the labours of the nursery was a girl of seventeen whose domestic education not having been particularly attended to left her with rather less knowledge of her duties in such a situation than might have been wished the confusion therefore which sometimes ensued in this department of the household was considerable but mrs major allen bore it all nay she rejoiced at the excellent opportunities this afforded of obtaining information concerning many infantine facts of which she had hitherto lived in total ignorance mrs sheepshanks who though sometimes a little fretful was in the main a good-natured woman always received these visits very kindly and indeed her respect for mrs allen was so great that she considered them as an honour for mrs allen had with friendly confidence mentioned to her how near she had been to marrying a lord of which indeed her beautiful shell necklace gave the most convincing proof and she also explained to her the very foolish bit of fun formerly recorded about the old clothes by which she offended her wealthy aunt and so lost the chance or rather the certainty of becoming her heiress these and many other anecdotes of her former life she had recorded in a manner which left no doubt on the mind of mrs sheepshanks respecting the distinguished rank of the society in which she had mingled in the mother country dear me mrs major allen only to think of your doing all that with your own hands exclaimed this kind-hearted mother of many colonists i am sure if it was not for the interest which i know you take in all these little matters just at present i should be actually fit to die to see you do such things never you mind mrs sheepshanks returned the major's lady i can't tell you how it all interests me pretty little darling it shall do everything it likes that it shall laugh a little bit then that's it laugh again baby laugh 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 kiss 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 tickle 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 blessed sweetheart i am sure it knows me and again mrs major allen applied the pap boat to the last born sheepshank's mouth though the overfed and intelligent infant immediately returned the superfluity without ceremony how do you think i hold a baby my dear demanded the anxious aspirant to maternal dignity oh very well very well indeed considering only you must mind about the pins little van diemen is pursing up his mouth now very much as if he were going to have a cry and he mostly cries when he gets a pin into him observed mrs sheepshanks little van diemen here gave the most unimpeachable testimony in favour of his mamma's sagacity for they had a cry and such a long and lusty one as might have daunted any novice of less firm spirit than mrs major allen she however hugged the little screamer tightly to her bosom and though it did not seem at all to comfort him held him there very close indeed for many minutes swaying her person backwards and forwards incessantly while one widely extended hand pressed firmly upon the upper joint of the vertebrae and the other upon the lower part of the infant's person kept it in a position as likely as anything short of suffocation to still the sound it is no good my dear mrs allen said the mother he'll go on that way till he's undressed again i'll bet anything just stop till i have finished combing these two and i'll look him over myself oh do let me undress him from top to toe cried mrs allen eagerly i have never done that my own self yet and i cannot tell you how i long for it will you let me try mrs sheepshanks yes sure if you like it stand still eliza can't you i am only afraid you'll find it a great plague in him screaming so why i should like it better if he didn't to be sure because it frightens me and in my situation that is not exactly the thing however it is quite needful i should get my hand in not but what i shall make the major give the highest of wages and that you know if anything can will get me a nurse so that i shan't have more to do than what my maternal feeling naturally leads to but nevertheless it is quite right and proper that i should know all about it myself there's a darling now continued the fond mother expectant addressing the still screaming baby there's a love just let me untie these strings only these strings my beautiful darling there there now donty wanty these last words being uttered in the coaxing idiom of her native country attracted the attention of the nursery-maid of all work who at that moment entered the room 
this girl having some years before accompanied her mother in a voyage from london under circumstances that by skilful management had rendered the excursion young as she was equally necessary for both was apt to boast of her metropolitan education and particularly prided herself on her parts of speech well now what does Dante Bonte mean i should like to know you'd better give over the child to me ma'am i knows his vase and he knows my words the style in which this dainty damsel who was frightfully marked by the smallpox approached was not conciliatory for her red arms were stuck akimbo and her nose always of the retroussé order turned up in very evident contempt mind your manners phoebe cried her mistress but phoebe strode on towards the low rocking-chair on which mrs major allen was seated and placing herself before her as close as it was possible to stand while a pair of squinting eyes that were intended to look boldly at her seemed wandering heaven knows where repeated in no very silvery tones you'd better give over the child to me upon every former occasion when mrs major allen had mixed herself up with the nursery arrangements of her friend the scene of action however active and interesting the business going on had always been the parlour but this happened to be washing-day and the absence of phoebe being absolutely certain till dinner-time mrs sheepshanks gave herself up altogether as she said to supply her place and nothing less than the pertinacity of mrs allen could have obtained an entrance into the house once pursued however into that receptacle of all litter her nursery the poor lady was perhaps not sorry to have some one as willing as mrs allen to nurse a baby for she had made up her mind that day to have a general review of all her children's heads and accordingly the major's lady was put in possession of the nursing chair and permitted as we have seen to revel in the delight of handling a baby to her heart's content so earnestly was she engaged in unravelling the manifold mysteries of baby buttons and strings that notwithstanding phoebe's abrupt address mrs allen did not raise her eyes towards the girl till she stood close before her face and when at last she did so she pushed the chair violently back very nearly let little van diemen fall out of her arms and uttered oh good gracious me in a voice that almost amounted to a scream lord have mercy what's the matter mrs allen cried mrs sheepshanks pushing aside the head upon which she was operating van isn't taken with a fit is he by this time the agitated mrs major allen had risen from the nursing chair and having hastily laid the baby in the cradle beside it she approached her friend with strong symptoms of agitation for heaven's sake come into the parlour with me for one moment my dear mrs sheepshanks she said i will not detain you more than a moment i am going home directly but indeed indeed i must speak to you first dear me i don't know what to do i'm sure with the butter and beer and all lying about in this way wouldn't it do mrs allen if i was to come in and hear what you want to say after dinner good heaven no you have no idea of the state of mind i am in indeed you must let me speak to you directly thus urged poor mrs sheepshanks though looking exceedingly distressed resigned her sponge and her combs placed everything upon the chimney-piece as much out of reach as she could wiped her hands upon her linen apron before she took it off and then followed her terrified-looking guest to the parlour oh my dear friend tell me your opinion honestly and truly i conjure you not to deceive me you have had great experience you must be able to form a judgment do you think there is any danger of my child's being like that dreadful girl what girl ma'am what is it you mean mrs allen said mrs sheepshanks looking a little cross and as if she did not as yet perceive any good and sufficient reason for her having been forced to abandon her important avocations in the nursery what girl oh with a violent shudder that frightful frightful girl that you call phoebe for heaven's sake mrs sheepshanks don't be out of temper don't be angry with me but consider my situation though i have been a married woman as you know for some years this is the first time in short you know what my condition is and now i implore you to tell me if you think there is any danger nervous and delicate as i am that my looking up so very suddenly close under that horrid girl's face is likely to mark the child what with the smallpox mrs allen said mrs sheepshanks with great simplicity i don't know mercy on me how should i know smallpox squinting that dreadful nose too oh mrs sheepshanks mrs sheepshanks 
all the happiness all the delight i have promised myself will be lost and destroyed for ever if my child is born in any way like that horrid girl here mrs major allen burst into a very passionate flood of tears and wrung her hands so piteously as she fixed her streaming eyes upon her neighbour's face that the good lady though thinking her cause of grief rather visionary could not refuse her sympathy and answered very kindly no indeed mrs allen i don't think you have got the least bit of reason to fear any such thing it is much more likely depend upon it that your dear babe should resemble its good-looking papa or your own self mrs allen who have got such good striking features than a girl that you never happen to look at but once that's it mrs sheepshanks that's just the most shocking and provoking part of it if i did not know that the major had always been considered as exceedingly handsome and myself too i won't deny it for why should i i was always counted something out of the common way in that respect and if i did not know all this as well as i do i should not mind the thing half so much but why should your child be like phoebe perkins mrs allen the girl is no beauty to be sure i'm not going to say she is but yet i can't understand why her ugliness should put you into such a way as this replied mrs sheepshanks with some little severity of emphasis for mercy's sake don't be angry with me my dear dear friend for mercy's sake don't reproach me something very unfortunate will happen i'm quite sure if you do you can't think i am certain you can't how i feel twas the suddenness mrs sheepshanks the shocking suddenness with which i looked up that made the danger as i take it tell me for pity's sake without being hasty with me did any such thing ever happen to you what thing mrs allen the seeing phoebe no no that i suppose you got accustomed to a little at a time as i may say and by degrees so unlike poor unlucky me but what i mean is if any of your children were ever marked in any way dear me no mrs allen replied this fond mother of many children with a very natural air of displeasure can't you see that they are not oh yes to be sure not in sight not in sight certainly sobbed out the agitated lady nor out of sight either i assure you ma'am oh my dear what a happy happy woman you are and so many of them like you too rejoined mrs allen in so very flattering and conciliatory a tone that her friend's little feeling of displeasure vanished at once and cordially seizing her hand she said don't you worry yourself about any such nonsense my dear mrs allen you go home and look in the glass and there it is that you'll see what your dear baby will be most like there was something in this assurance so calculated to touch the heart of mrs major allen that she could not resist it with an emotion over which she really seemed to have no control she threw her arms round the neck of the kind prophetess and bestowed upon her a very fervent kiss heaven grant that your words may come true my dear dear mrs sheepshanks she exclaimed with her eyes once more flashing through her tears i do declare that if i could have a girl exactly like what i was when captain tate first came to silverton i should be the very happiest woman in the world well then i'm sure i hope you will but i suppose you'd like it to be a little like the major too said mrs sheepshanks playfully oh about that i don't know my dear if you could know what i was at the time i talk about i don't think you'd advise any alteration unless it was to be a boy indeed and then i suppose you would be better pleased still most ladies like to have a boy first but i don't though replied mrs major allen rather sharply that's all very well for people who are never celebrated for having anything particular about them but where there is beauty and great family beauty particularly it is certainly most desirable to have a girl because it's likely to answer best well then returned mrs sheepshanks rising hastily for she heard sounds alarmingly indicative of a general nursery riot well then dear mrs allen go home sit down before your looking-glass and take my word for it there is a deal better chance that your child will be like what you see there than to poor pock fret and phoebe good-bye good-bye mrs major allen delayed not a moment longer but took leave as briskly as mrs sheepshanks herself could desire there was certainly something like superstitious respect in the reverence with which mrs major allen listened to every word apropos of maternity which fell from the lips of this lady 
looking neither to the right hand nor to the left and terribly afraid that some acquaintance might stop her ere she reached her home mrs allen hurried forward with as rapid a step as she considered prudent under existing circumstances and the moment her door was opened to her hastened upstairs without pausing to make any of the little domestic inquiries which usually followed her return for a moment she sat down to recover breath and then slowly and carefully and without too much exertion permitted herself to draw the table which served her for a toilette into what she considered to be the most advantageous light not the strongest perhaps but that which by former experiments she knew would show the most favourably to her own eyes that large portion of her charms still left unscathed by time having hazarded this active but unnecessary exercise mrs allen placed herself in a soft and ample chair and sat for some minutes of complete and soothing repose with her mirror at the right angle and her own still bright eyes very fondly fixed upon it the motive for the occupation in which she was employed perhaps gave an additional charm to her expression and she thought she was almost as handsome as ever there was however none of that dangerous confidence of self-conceit in mrs allen which leads some people to fancy that they are quite handsome enough and need no improvement on the contrary in her very best days she had never encouraged the belief that her beauty remarkable as it was required no assistance from human ingenuity and skill she knew the contrary and even now alone as she was and under the influence only of motives the most pure and sublime that can elevate the heart or the art of women she shook off the feeling of fatigue with her exertions at mrs sheepshanks had occasioned and ceased not to add touch to touch and divide and subdivide ringlet from ringlet till as she gazed on the finished picture she felt that there was no more to be done a poet has said that industry to beauty adds new grace and though it is probable that this expression originally alluded to labours of another kind it is impossible not to perceive that it may be beautifully applied to the charming woman whose image is now before our mind's eye nothing surely can be imagined more touching than the occupation and appearance of mrs allen at this time and a painter would do well to seize and embody a moment of feeling so calculated to find sympathy in every female heart we all know that pretty women love to adorn themselves for conquest and we smile though with no very harsh satire at the vanity that flutters the while around their fair bosoms but how different was the spectacle offered by mrs major allen as she sat in her lone chamber in van diemen's land her whole soul occupied it is true with the idea of her own beauty but in the hope not of slaying whole hecatombs of lovers with that beauty as perhaps she might have dreamed of in the giddy days of yore but of transmitting it to a dear pledge of wedded love who should carry it down through unnumbered generations of posterity callous must be the heart and lifeless the imagination that does not kindle at this image End of chapter one chapter two of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two pride and pleasure portrait of a mother domestic anecdotes affectionate reminiscences confidence promised at length the happy hour arrived and mrs major allen became a mother only those who have waited as long as this lady had done for the honoured blessing can be capable of appreciating her feelings on the occasion it is not nevertheless recorded of her by those who knew her best that any very remarkable development of the organ of philo progenitiveness was perceptible in her formation the triumphant gladness of her heart arose from a complex variety of intellectual impressions with which this sort of mere animal organization had in truth very little to do it was the consciousness that while almost all other married ladies had children she had none which had galled her it was the idea that her well secured money would have to go to somebody who did not belong to her that rankled at her heart and it was a vague suspicion that her gay husband occasionally alluded to her childless condition and quizzed her ignorance of all nursery concerns in his conversation with other and perhaps younger ladies which irritated her spirit it was therefore the cure for all these gnawing griefs that she blessed and hailed with rapture when a bouncing stout screaming little girl was put into her arms most ladies love a little fuss upon such occasions and it is not very wonderful if mrs major allen coveted a good deal 
though feeling as little like an invalid as any lady ever did under such circumstances she would not abate an hour of the regular stipulated month's confinement which she had heard repeatedly spoken of as the proper period of retreat for ladies of delicate health not indeed that she desired to live alone till the baby moon's evolution was complete on the contrary not only her friend and constant preceptress mrs sheepshanks but all the other genteel ladies of sydney were given to understand that they might come to look at mrs major allen and her beautiful baby every morning if they liked it and as very sufficient caudle and vast quantities of plum cake were daily distributed they all did like it very much and came accordingly any lady of any land might indeed have found much in mrs allen's sydney dressing-room at this time to repay the trouble of a visit provided that is to say it was within tolerably easy reach of them it might not perhaps have been worth while to sail round half the world in order to enter it yet there was a vast deal there both to see and to admire reading people already know that mrs major allen was remarkable for her taste in dress and that wherever display was called for her peculiar genius appeared to the greatest advantage the retirement of a sick chamber might by many be considered as likely to check at least for a time this propensity for striking decoration but such was not the case with mrs allen and though in a different style her toilette was as distinguished during her first month of maternity as at any period of her existence from the hour she quitted her bed which feeling herself exceedingly strong and well she insisted upon doing with as little loss of time as possible her costume was perfect this part of the business had been long meditated upon and the preparation for it having commenced at a very early stage of her hopes was persevered in with unwearied industry to the end her long-loved satin stitch was upon this occasion as heretofore of the most essential use to her indeed without it she never could have reached that perfection of attire for herself her room and her child which became the admiration of sydney and all its neighbouring villas where a great effect is produced by very delicate touches it is not altogether easy either to follow the process or do justice to the result but what is both original and beautiful should never be passed over in silence from the doubting timidity of those whose duty it is to describe it the curtains of mrs major allen's apartment were upon this occasion a full rose-coloured calico covered with a species of muslin so open in its texture as to be exported for mosquito-nets upon the draperies of these she had some weeks before her confinement affixed some white scallops of her own invention each one having a little tassel of rose-coloured calico cut into slips attached to it her sofa removed from the parlour for the occasion was clothed in the same style and elicited an exclamation of wonder and delight from every one who approached it three small cushions carelessly balanced on the back and arms of this extensive couch were also of the same gay and happy hue and not a corner of them but showed in patterns of labyrinthine grace and intricacy the powers of a skilful needle mrs major allen herself was habited in a robe of white which though not of a particularly fine texture was really exquisitely elegant as all the sydney ladies agreed from the profusion of elaborate satin stitch bestowed upon its cuffs and collar i always said so observed mrs major allen to her nurse the first time she put on one of the two beautiful robes thus prepared i always said that there was nothing in the whole world like satin stitch for giving an elegant finish and i will tell you what nurse you may depend upon it that amongst all the things that a woman does there is nothing positively nothing that answers so well as satin stitch it is no use to talk of the cap of mrs major allen upon this occasion for she not only wore a succession of caps all more or less indebted to the same favourite decoration for their superiority to all other caps but moreover with a refinement of taste and ingenuity of arrangement only to be equalled perhaps by the manner in which progressive sunshine is made to steal upon the pictures of the diorama almost every day was made to chronicle her approach to convalescence by some delicate strengthening if i may so say of her beauty the rouge which long habit had made so habitually a part of her daily puttings on that within twenty-four hours of miss allen's birth the maternal cheek had received a little red was nevertheless used with such forbearing moderation that the lady looked as she ought to do considerably paler than usual and it was only by increasing day by day the skilfully modulated bloom that at the happy termination of her month mrs major allen appeared as glowing a representation of youth beauty and health as before the copious quantity of ringlets too 
which excepting that they happened to be of a somewhat softer texture differed little from those which had fanned the dusty air of the silverton ballroom when she danced with captain tate appeared in like manner by degrees and to use voltaire's charming words returned to enchant the world pas à pas comme un jour deux dans les yeux délicats when first she sat up in bed one shining black corkscrew peeping forth from each side beneath the embroidered nightcap was all that she deemed congruous to her condition on the morrow a second came and then a third till at length the whole pendant mass black as night yet lustrous in its rich and oily glossiness once more spread its lurid glories on each side her radiant face as to the dress and general appearance of the baby it varied according to the hours of the day its admirable mother who piqued herself on being an excellent manager was a great economist in all that appertained to the laundry department and before it was many hours old she discovered that care must be taken as to its dear little expenses in that line as well as in papa's and her own so the darling poppet was not always prepared for company but when it was the fullness of the mother's heart might easily be read in the elaborate decoration of its attire in a word new south wales had never before seen such a mother and child and nothing could exceed the admiration they inspired or the high consideration in which the allen family one and all were held meanwhile the major kept his word and did take care that all the little parties in which he was engaged either at home or abroad should answer nevertheless his parental prudence kept pace with his success and his lady's tightly settled and regularly remitted income continued to supply all their expenses so that the major's steady winnings went on accumulating in a manner that spoke strongly of the fundamental improvement which had taken place in his character and morals since the period when the reader and mrs barnaby were first introduced to him at clifton these winnings indeed particularly if stated night after night or day by day would to european ears appear mere bagatelles hardly worth recording in a professional gamester's account but to an inhabitant of sydney the yearly aggregate if roundly named which however never happened to occur would have been considered as enormous in this case as in every other unremitting perseverance does wonders nulla dies sine linea is a receipt to fill volumes and on the same principles a purse of no small dimensions may be filled by one who playing with assured success never suffers any hour in the day and night to be passed in idleness when it is possible to put a pack of cards in action such was the system of major allen and though on a small scale sydney was no bad field of action for him assuredly there was no crockford's where within the space of half a night a man without quitting his chair may be sure of finding an opportunity if he seek it of beggaring himself for his neighbour but there were little quiet corners where by day or night small hazards might be played for among the idlers of which the more industrious part of the population knew little or nothing and a taste for that tempting seesaw the gaming-table generated perhaps in the brilliant salons of paris or the club-houses of london may find wherewithal to keep itself alive even in the deep retreats of new south wales major allen was therefore by no means an idle man neither could he fairly be called an intemperate one the glass of rum and milk that greeted the morn and the tumbler or two of whisky toddy that hailed the genial hours of night cannot be justly quoted in contradiction to this for nobody ever saw major allen drunk moreover his habits in all things appertaining to expenditure were exceedingly careful though he by no means denied himself the constant comfort of a good dinner or the occasional gratification of a little display so that he and his lady were decidedly classed among the very first people in sydney in temper and general domestic demeanour as favourable a report may be made of him as most gentlemen under similar circumstances would be likely to deserve so on the whole it is to be hoped that the character of this individual who from his near connection with my heroine must make an important figure in the drama of her future life may be considered in all respects as improved rather than the contrary since the reader parted from him but notwithstanding all these excellent domestic qualities major allen was not what could be called a confidential husband indeed there were some circumstances connected with his first appearance in the colony which his wife was never fully able to understand it was evident that he had some powerful friends among the persons in authority and the deference and very strict observance he paid them proved him to be of a most grateful temper but he never entered with his charming lady into any explanation of the origin of this close connection between them 
neither did he appear to deem it necessary that she should be troubled with any statement respecting the little sums he was accumulating nay his notions of a well-regulated family economy might have led him to prefer taking his lady's income under his own immediate and separate control but here after a somewhat spirited trial on occasion of the two first quarterly payments he gave in mrs allen not being a woman to give way easily where she felt herself to be right so thenceforward he contented himself with knowing that all household expenses of every kind whatever including of course his own dress and little personal appointments were defrayed regularly and in the most creditable manner that is to say without credit by this fund now and then indeed thinking the little occasional assistance which her quick faculties enabled her to afford whenever his favourite amusement went on in her presence gave her some right to inquire she ventured to question him respecting his winnings but the following short specimen of such dialogues will show that he well knew how to answer them for heaven's sake major what do you do with all your winnings she said to him one day when she would greatly have liked to have got hold of a portion of them to assist in the purchase of a little finery i see you pocket lots of cash night after night and when am i to be the better for it don't put yourself in a flurry my love i often lose money of course though god knows and you know too my love that i always take every possible precaution to avoid it but nevertheless it will happen you have not got the face to tell me that you do not make money by playing said mrs major allen with some appearance of excitement no my love i know my duty both to myself and you too well to continue playing if such were the case but it is an amusement that i like and i take the most scrupulous care that it shall never become an annoyance to you my dear angel which you know it must do did i not care when i win to lay by the amount to be in readiness for the time when i may lose mrs major allen snuffed the air with a slight appearance of agitation but only said i hope you do lay it by major allen this occurred some months before the birth of the little martha and it was then she was exactly three months old that a snug small evening party at home attended with a run of very obvious good fortune led to a renewal of the subject a pretty sum you must have pouched last night major said his lady as she poured out his tea on the following morning while their infant heiress lay sweetly slumbering in a cradle at her side yes my love pretty well then i do trust our poor child will be the better for it said mrs major allen putting down the teapot and placing her right hand on the top of the cradle while with the other she fondly dallied with the little coverlid as if it wanted more tucking in than she had given it a dozen times over already i do hope major allen that for the first time in your life you will do something to assist in the maintenance of your family my family replied the major chirruping very affectionately towards the cradle have not been very long in want of maintenance why we have been married replied mrs allen above a year sir and except just furnishing the place and giving me that trumpery necklace which is no more to be compared to my shells than light to darkness you have never spent to my knowledge a single farthing of your own from that hour to this if it had not been for my own fortune your family would have been pretty much in want of a maintenance my dearest creature can you imagine that a man of my knowledge of the world and general savoir vivre would ever have been guilty of that most unpardonable of all human actions the marrying a woman without fortune no my beautiful mrs major allen i adore you far too vehemently ever to have been guilty of such treacherous unmanly baseness as to have seduced you into marriage with with in short my love with myself had i known that though not so rich as i once thought you there was no danger of your actually starving in consequence of your affection for me and you probably thought there might be no danger of your own starving either dear major replied the lady laughing a sort of experimental laugh as not quite certain how the hit might be taken however her excellent husband was in extremely good humour and only laughed a little in return buttering his toast the while as pleasantly as possible this of course acted as an encouragement upon the lady as she again hinted that she should like a little money upon my word i shall be delighted to oblige you my dearest mrs allen he replied with every appearance of gravity but the birth of this darling babe furnishes the very strongest motive a man is capable of feeling for prudence and economy i cannot give you money my dear love it is the greatest possible grief for me to be obliged to say so but i should never forgive myself never 
nor ever i truly believe should i sleep in peace again did i for a moment yield to any temptation that might affect the future fortune of our dear little daughter here again the major cherupped at the cradle and mrs allen heaving a deep sigh only muttered in reply then it is quite impossible i should buy any feathers for her bonnet the tone of this very happy new south welsh couple to each other was in more respects than one rather singular there was occasionally a vast deal of fondness displayed on both sides yet a sharp observer might sometimes have fancied that there was some latent feeling of suspicion and reserve at their hearts if this however was really the case they conducted themselves on the whole with great discretion and might not unaptly have been quoted as a proof that all feelings with proper schooling may ever be made subservient to will this indeed must always be the case where motive is strong and motive was strong enough both in the major and his lady to produce a line of conduct in each running so parallel to each other that there was little or no danger of their ever producing a concussion by crossing thus major allen never even in his most playful moments nor when the whisky toddy had been the most seductive hazarded the slightest allusion either to his friend maintry or to his excellent servant william or to the cause or manner of his voyage out or to the beautiful isabella d'almafonte or even to the duke of wellington while on the other hand mrs major allen appeared totally to have forgotten silverton park and her beautiful set of greys never gave the slightest indication of remembering such a place as clifton such as an abigail as betty jacks such wretches as the tradesmen of cheltenham or such an extraordinary dull place as the fleet prison there can be no doubt in the world that this was the best plan they could follow for without it there would have been so remarkable a discrepancy between their confidential reminiscences and the dignified strain of their ordinary bearing as must have made their lives appear even to each other like one long drawn-out conspiracy whereas under the existing system everything went on smoothly that it might almost be doubted whether they had not really and truly undergone some lithian process which had cleared off effectually and for ever all the heavier shadows that hung upon the background of their past existence in a word bygones are bygones would have been the most expressive and appropriate motto that they could possibly have adopted mrs major allen was certainly in many respects a very clever woman having acutely enough found out what the major's tactics were and were likely to be respecting the past she not only adopted the same with very excellent feminine tact but taking the fullest advantage of the general amnesty thus granted by memory to all former faults and follies she gazed at her black-eyed little daughter with renewed hope and renewed ambition and felt as fresh in spirit and as ready to set off again in pursuit of new plots and new projects as if she had never met with a disappointment in her life but if she wisely cast a veil over what it was disagreeable to remember the same wisdom led her as much as it was possible to do so to keep for ever before her husband's eyes her own and those of everybody who approached her the recollection of all that was creditable in which she could claim a share those who know the character of the man can feel no doubt that here too the happy sympathy of disposition existing between the married pair would have manifested itself if the thing had been possible but herein it would seem that the lady had the advantage of the gentleman for while she discoursed pretty considerably at large concerning her aunt compton of compton bassett her dearly beloved niece mrs general hubert and above all of her great friend and great connection lady elizabeth norris the major though now and then in general sydney society echoing the affectionate family allusions of his wife was never heard to obtrude the mention of his own relations upon anybody it was impossible for a woman so acute as mrs major allen not to perceive that these frequent references to the old country increased their consideration in the new one and this indeed so evidently that at length it struck her as being well worth while to make an effort towards renewing some intercourse with those the far-off sound of whose names was so advantageous one afternoon that the major who not unfrequently passed his soirees from home had declared his intention of remaining during the entire evening in his own mansion where he hoped a friend would call and perhaps play a quiet game or two at piquet with him he happened to say after giving his lady instructions about making the toddy and one or two other little particulars i like to think dearest that whatever i do win will be sure sooner or later to help out the fortune of our darling baby nothing was so sure to put mrs major allen in good humour as an observation of this kind from her husband for the charming buoyancy of her spirits was such that she already though her young daughter was little more than a twelve-month old 
had determined in her own mind that the third martha should do better in life than either of her beautiful predecessors had done with a degree of contentment to which no words can do justice she perceived in the features hair and complexion of her child that she had not gazed upon her own image in vain and blessing the prescient tenderness which had dictated her doing so she prophesied as she contemplated the black eyes and dark hair of the darling that in her the race of compton should rise higher than all aunt betsy's economy had ever yet contrived to place it mindful however of the many proofs which had met her in the course of her career that money was an important auxiliary in all affairs of love she became perhaps almost immoderately anxious as to everything that concerned the little martha's pecuniary interests it is possible that the major was in some degree aware of this for it is certain that whenever particularly desirous of ensuring the concurrence or aid of his lady in any of his little schemes he now invariably hinted that it was probable their result if well managed would be favourable to the future prospects of their daughter on the occasion above alluded to his reference to this produced the happiest effect mrs allen smiled with the greatest sweetness and even playfully pinched his cheek as she replied never fear me dear hoard away major and when you have got enough to take us back why back we will go won't we the major returned the pinch nodded his head but said nothing i suppose you are afraid to promise major for fear i should plague you about it eh don't be afraid i shall know how to mind my hits and shall not be over stupid i dare say in giving a guess about the when and the how too though i may not happen positively to know anything about it however if you will take my advice you will turn your thoughts that way let it be as long as it will before you can turn yourself unless indeed there is any particular reason why you should stay here for life for life oh no my love decidedly not for life replied the major rather eagerly but i don't quite understand dear what you mean by turning my thoughts that way he continued with a musing air and then after a moment's pause added to say the truth my dear mrs allen my thoughts seldom turn for long together in any other direction the doings here my dear let a man be as persevering as he will are pitiful in the extreme and it is impossible to think of what's going on every night on the other side of the water without being devilishly provoked i promise you particularly when a man feels that he improves every day he lives mrs major allen listened to this with the greatest satisfaction it was the first time she had ever heard her husband distinctly declare an intention of returning to england and though at the very bottom of her heart she had determined to do so herself one day or other even if she found herself obliged to leave him behind the discovering that his wishes accorded with her own was highly gratifying and she immediately determined upon opening her mind to him concerning a scheme that had for some time past occupied her head my darling major she exclaimed how delighted i am to hear you talk so remember the saying where there's a will there's a way and do you only give me your promise that when you can go you will and i will give mine to push on in every way possible to the same delightful end i will spend just next to nothing dearest in any way i will buy no feathers either for baby or myself and almost no flowers neither i'll promise not to think of any more satin dresses if it is for almost a dozen years to come and i will trust for making a decent appearance altogether to turning trimming and satin stitch in short my dearest major there is nothing in the whole world that i would not do to get back i am glad to hear all this my love very glad there is nothing like having a few rouleaux beforehand my dear depend upon it stick to the saving plan about clothes and all your own little expenses and it is quite impossible to say what may be the fruits of it one of these days oh but you don't know major what else i have got in my head replied his wife with a gay glance that reminded him of clifton when we do go back it shall not be my fault if we do not find somebody worth introducing our child to who will that be my dear said he with a glance almost as gay as her own to my lord mucklebury for with a degree of generous confidence which really did honour to her heart mrs major allen had confessed to her husband how very near marriage she had been with that nobleman and how completely it was owing to a mere accidental misunderstanding between them that the match had been broken off it is by no means impossible that i may do that good service both to you and to her my love answered the lady for i have every reason to flatter myself that what was love very fervent love certainly has now mellowed into friendship 
and i have little doubt that by the time we return he may be able to see me and even my child without pain though he may perhaps have a guiltless sigh that he is not the father of it but it was not of him major allen i do assure you that it was not of him i was thinking of whom then mrs allen of those clifton people pray do not let us talk about them for in the first instance i hate them all particularly and in the next they are not in a station of life that can do me or any man of fashion service mrs allen was not at all displeased at hearing her husband thus class himself but her change of colour would have been visible had she not worn rouge when he named clifton the emotion passed however and she resumed without any trace of embarrassment no 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 major allen i am not so humble-minded as you imagine it is not my brother and sister peters nor any of my nephews and nieces in that very commercial district that i am thinking about but of persons in a very different station i assure you be patient for a moment and i will explain myself the major was at that moment smoking a cigar and continued the operation with as much composure as she could have desired while she rose from her chair and opened the drawer of a work-table at the further extremity of the apartment from this drawer she took what might be recognized at the first glance as an english newspaper and which though of no very recent date was the last thing that had been received in the colony i have promised never to be extravagant again my dear said the lady advancing up the room and searching the precious columns as she walked for the article she wished to show him and therefore you must not scold me for having bought this newspaper i really could not resist it when i found this paragraph concerning the very nearest relations i have in the world let me read it to you shall i the major smoked on but graciously nodded his head it is the account of a drawing-room held at st james palace major allen i was always fond of reading those sort of articles even in england for nothing keeps up our acquaintance with the fashionable world so well besides the inside it gives one into dress and here of course it is ten thousand times more valuable still to prevent one's forgetting the very names of one's relations and all other persons of rank here mrs major allen began reading a very long list of persons present at the drawing-room and at length came to the names of general and mrs hubert as being among them i suppose you know who she is major allen if you do not remember him not i said the major what my dear don't you remember my darling niece agnes the girl that i devoted myself to so completely before she married what the little willoughby who was so skittish that she would never let one speak to her oh dear yes i remember her perfectly well major it is she who is now mrs general hubert and who has been as you perceive presented at court oh she married the stiff-backed colonel did she i forgot all about it my dear and is it to the general's lady that you are going to introduce me there was a comic sort of leer in the eye of the major as he said this which his wife did not altogether understand but after looking at him for a moment she replied to be sure it is my dear my darling agnes mrs general hubert as of course i must now call her will be beyond all question the most fitting and proper person to introduce our daughter into society nor is there the slightest reason why she should not be presented at court when she is old enough and it is just because she is not old enough yet that i am content to wait so patiently till it may suit you my dear major to accompany us back to europe but though there might be no particular use in our going as yet it will as i have lately thought be extremely proper for me to write to my niece and i certainly shall do so immediately depend upon it my dear i shall make no sort of objection replied the amiable major but you don't think it just possible that she may not answer you no major allen i do not i know better than any one else can except herself dear child how devoted was the attachment i showed her and it is not in nature to believe that whenever i choose to recall myself to her remembrance she should be otherwise than delighted at hearing from me i will not deny that some trifling circumstances occurred previous to her marriage and to mine which displeased me however everything was made up most affectionately before i left england and a very touching scene it was i assure you with poor dear willoughby her father who suddenly returned from some place like this i don't know where abroad and brought another daughter with him a charming creature she is 
not quite so lovely and elegant looking as my niece but very pretty and married to an extremely rich young son of a baronet so you see major the connection throughout is most extremely desirable for our martha and when the time comes for our return will unquestionably be one of the greatest importance to her so right i shall most decidedly the indifference with which the major at first appeared to listen to her relaxed by degrees as she went on and when at length she paused he said without any sneer at all very well my dear you are perfectly a woman of the world which is exactly what i would wish you to be and nothing could be more desirable than that our little girl should in due time be introduced to such very near relations but i believe i have hinted to you before that there are two or three reasons which should render my immediate return to england inconvenient i have hitherto never entered upon any explanation of them because in fact they possessed little interest in themselves and were of no consequence whatever to us in our present situation but if it should prove that there really is any chance of our getting among the set you mention when we get back it may be as well to make you understand the affair sufficiently to prevent any awkward blunders on your part which might be inconvenient not that the thing in point of fact is of any great consequence but nevertheless as it involves some trifling etiquette that some sort of people think a great deal about it may be as well to put you au fait of the business and i shall have great pleasure i am sure in giving you this proof of my confidence but here comes our friend belmaine remember love all our established hints and tokens and remember also that whatever i do chance to win will be added to the fund which i trust we shall be able to lay up for our dear girl's benefit there he is obliged to knock again why does not that stupid girl open the door we will finish our talk to-morrow dear only remember that you are not to write to england till i have explained myself the worthy mr belmaine here made his appearance and was received in the most friendly manner both by the major and his lady he was not an old acquaintance but appeared to be a very valued one for nothing was omitted that could make their substantial tea-drinking agreeable and the little martha who with almost precocious strength of limb already waddled fearlessly over the floor was induced to add her note of welcome by a wonderfully articulated ta-ta soon after the meal was concluded mrs major allen retired for a few moments to superintend the coucher of her beautiful child and ere she returned the two gentlemen had very rationally sought and found consolation for her absence in a pack of cards whenever major allen indulged himself in the presence of his wife with a game at piquet whist or écarté the only amusements of the kind he ever ventured upon his lady had the appearance of being in what is vulgarly called a fidget for she walked about the room looked at the different hands and in short seemed in search of amusement for herself which she could not find on such occasions it was usual for the major to say pray my dear love do sit down you have no idea how you worry me by moving about so and she replied well then my dear i will take my work and amuse myself now and then by looking at your hand and then she did take her work and sat down behind him very close indeed sometimes twitching his hair in a lively manner and sometimes playfully running her needle into his shoulder always permitting her animated eyes to invite his partner to take part in the jest after enduring this for about five minutes it was usual for the major to lose his patience and to exclaim upon my word my love i cannot play if you go on so you are as frolicsome as a kitten dearest and i give you my honour i can't bear to check you but upon my soul i am such a nervous player that i don't know what i'm about for two minutes together while you are playing your monkey tricks could you not take your work a little further away love mrs major allen could never stand this reproof but constantly replied rather in a plaintive tone and a pretty dull sort of work i shall find it i dare say mr this or mr that whoever the major's partner might be will not be so cross as you are dear so i will go and sit by him and she did go and sit by him or rather behind him but so quietly that it was next to impossible that he should be churlish enough to make any objection to her remaining there this little domestic scene was repeated on the present occasion with just sufficient variation as to the phrase and frolic as might suffice to prevent its appearing stupidly repetitive but when it had been gone through and mrs major allen had established herself exactly in the place she wished to occupy her attention involuntarily wandered from the game she overlooked at the present moment 
to the greater one in which she flattered herself she should be engaged at a future time the mysterious words of her husband too haunted her rather painfully the spelling and putting together which her active intellect rendered inevitable produced a result which if not quite new to her imagination appeared at this moment more than usually important and in short it was with the greatest difficulty that she conducted herself throughout the very long evening according to her husband's wishes she really exerted herself however to do the best she could and when at length the beefsteak sweet potatoes and whisky toddy were called for she performed all the duties of a careful hostess perfectly so that at last at about two o'clock in the morning the snug little party broke up under circumstances perfectly satisfactory to the major who gave his weary wife the reward she well merited by saying as he drew up the strings of his inflated purse thank you my dear everything was very nice and very well managed now let us get to bed and to-morrow morning we will have a talk about the best way for you to write home to your relations it would be a fine thing for our little missy to be sure and i think it may be done if we manage well people talk of good fortune and bad fortune but depend upon it my dear barnaby it was thus he ever addressed her when in particularly high spirits depend upon it that it is human skill which regulates human affairs and that when some great misfortune befalls us it is because we have committed some great blunder while on the contrary if some striking blessing as it is called rewards our endeavours it proves beyond the possibility of any reasonable doubt that we have known how to set about what we had to do and perform the task skilfully and well there don't let us talk any more to-night because that last glass of toddy has made me very sleepy good-night dear Good night. End of chapter two. Chapter three of the widow married a sequel to the widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three. The promised confidence bestowed. Interesting narrative. Conjugal harmony. Renewed correspondence that nothing might interrupt the conversation which mrs major allen was quite determined should not be delayed she would not even suffer her daughter to appear at the breakfast-table the following morning but though the young lady was crying pretty lustily at the other end of the house ventured to assure her papa when he kindly inquired for her that she was fast asleep having set all things in such order that no further assistance from without could be required mrs allen thus began well major allen i have made up my mind not to let this blessed day pass over my head without writing to my dear niece mrs general hubert i have been looking over the paper again there is the whole account of her dress at full length which i quite forgot to show you my dear such taste such splendour don't you think my dear allen that it is our bounden duty to leave not a stone unturned that might help to place our dear child among such cousins as these we will leave neither sticks nor stones unturned as you call it my dear but the matter must be managed very judiciously there is no doubt in the world that the relationship is quite near enough to render our entering their circle perfectly natural and proper and considering all you did for that girl agnes it can hardly be doubted that she will welcome you with open arms she must be a monster indeed if she did not nevertheless strange as it may seem to you my dear creature there will be a good deal of caution necessary in the manner in which you introduce me to them mrs major allen put down the portion of buttered roll which she was in the act of raising to her lips and turned rather faint however as she by no means wished the major to guess what was passing in her mind she made an effort to recover herself which was as successful as such efforts always are and then she replied with great apparent composure well dearie you said i should know all about it to-day so get on there's a good man i am afraid of nothing not i so speak out and you shall never see me flinch you are a charming creature my love and deserve all the devoted attachment i have shown you now listen to me then and join your excellent judgment to mine as to the best mode of conquering the difficulties which lie in our way but first i must ask you if you have written at all to england since the death of o'donagough or since your marriage with me why no my dear to say the truth i have not replied the lady for to speak honestly i felt half afraid of being laughed at for the facility with which i suffered my former passion to regain its hold upon me you were right perfectly right 
i am exceedingly glad of this for reasons which i can easily explain to you then in fact dear you have never sent any letter to europe signed with my name nor any announcing your last husband's death no i never have and you never shall my darling returned the major in an accent of very ardent tenderness mrs major allen looked very much as if she wished to say why but she conquered the wish as she felt it deeming it best to let her husband tell his story his own way after a pause sufficiently long to permit his finishing his first cup of tea the major continued no my love never this declaration must i am sure astonish you though your sweet reliance on me will not permit you to say so believe me darling this noble confidence is not misplaced and the time will come doubt it not when you will thank me for the prudence which thus anxiously seeks to spare you all alarm the fact is my love that an affair of honour which ended fatally was the cause of my leaving england mrs major allen did not believe one word of this but she was an admirable wife and instead of contumaciously expressing any doubt meekly replied really yes my love my unerring hand sent the leaden messenger of death too truly and nothing but the conscientious conviction that the wretch who thus fell deserved his fate could console me for being the author of it as the major said this he concealed his agitation or at any rate his face by his extended hand leaving room however between his third and fourth finger to peep at the face of his wife and see how she wore it fortunately that excellent and intelligent lady perceived that he did so and immediately checked an inclination to smile which might have been disagreeably interpreted so instead of this she blew her nose and then said very gravely oh my dear there is no good in fretting and vexing about those kinds of things they must happen you know occasionally and to say the truth i did not think that any gentleman of your profession any military gentleman i mean would have thought much about it you are quite right my dear quite right in a general way but there were one or two very unfortunate circumstances attending this affair in the first place we had no surgeon on the ground this of itself you know though purely accidental on my part lays one open to the most abominable constructions then my adversary's second ran away stupid fellow as if any arm could have come to him in short i was advised by my lawyer himself as well as by all my military friends not to run the risk of a trial this sweetest is my history and now you will be at no loss to understand why i should never wish you to send a letter to your friends in england signed with the guiltless but unfortunate name of allen there was the struggle of a moment in the heart of mrs allen as to whether she should have the pleasure of telling the master of her destiny that she was a vast deal too clever to believe a single word of all he said or suffer him to lie his way unchecked out of the very disagreeable predicament in which she was pretty confident he was placed but luckily she remembered the weakness of a divided bundle of faggots and at the same instant determined at once to swallow whatever her spouse in his wisdom thought it convenient to administer and moreover to the very best of her power to make all others swallow it likewise you may depend upon it my dear i shall sign the letter i am going to write to my dear agnes with whatever name you bid me was the gentle and generous answer of mrs allen as soon as she had made up her mind to keep her cleverness to herself and perhaps she gave this promise the more readily from remembering as she spoke the name of agnes how very little honour either in her eyes or in those of general hubert that of allen was likely to confer on the young cousin she was about to announce to them even if unaccompanied by any of the adventures which she thought it possible might have become connected with it since they last had the pleasure of hearing it pronounced by her no man was ever blessed with a more charming wife than i am cried the major with sudden gaiety and probably well pleased at having got through the business of explanation so happily then after a moment's consideration he added why my dear should you not continue your late name of o'donagough upon my honour i have no prejudice whatever against it if you have not and the doing so might perhaps be less embarrassing for you than taking any other this proposition evidently took the lady by surprise and the manner in which she now looked up in the major's face was without any premeditation at all perhaps you have some objection to this my dear perhaps the name of allen is dearer to you than all others said the major oh i don't know i'm sure anything about that it would be foolish you know my dear to take fancies when we are talking about business 
replied his high-minded wife i only look so because i don't quite understand what it is you would be at am i to tell my niece and my nephew the general and my brother-in-law mr willoughby and all the rest of them that you are a relative of my late husband mr o'donagough by no means my love that must inevitably create confusion what i propose is merely that you should state yourself still to be the wife of the respected mr o'donagough himself but good gracious major how could i do that when we go back after every one of them has seen mr o'donagough and has been regularly introduced to him in person and besides she added somewhat in a lower key they have most of them seen you into the bargain true dearest true all quite true nevertheless i do not anticipate the slightest inconvenience from this i have had the honour to see some of your amiable relations certainly and i question not but they have also seen me they may likewise have seen your late estimable husband all this i grant you but it will make no difference whatever my love do not be uneasy about that it will give us no trouble worth naming i assure you i must confess that now you do puzzle me replied mrs major allen with great naivete and i don't know the least bit in the world what you mean major allen smiled with great complacency upon his charming wife as he answered my lovely barnaby you are without flattery one of the sharpest witted and most intelligent women i ever met with and it is only on points where nothing but experience and a more extended knowledge of the world has assisted me that i can assume any sort of superiority to you and even here you have only to open your own charming eyes a little in order if not exactly to overtake me at least to lessen the distance between us this business of identity dear love is a mere bugbear a man of any tolerable degree of talent snaps his fingers at it the late o'donagough was tall was he not yes replied mrs major allen succinctly and so am i my love this believe me is the only point of difference between man and man which is really of importance and even that may be greatly modified of course dearest i do not speak of cases of daily intimate intercourse this i know does create difficulty and yet here the major smiled and seemed to have some amusing anecdote at the tip of his tongue but he checked the wish to utter it and only said with a very matter-of-fact gravity neither mr o'donagough nor i were ever very intimate with these great folks whose favour you now wish to propitiate therefore on that score there can be no fear of mischief and now i want your opinion speak out dear have you any personal objection to this plan independent i mean of any fancied embarrassment in putting it into execution no i think not replied mrs major allen with considerable promptitude and sincerity of tone for during the major's last speech she had run over in her mind all the reasons which existed against her particularly wishing to introduce the father of her intended peeress as the major allen of clifton and had come very decidedly to the conclusion that she had much rather call him by any other name under heaven the major at once saw that whatever objections might in the first instance have occurred to his proposal were already removed and in the fulness of his contentment he gave his lady a kiss and once more called her his charming barnaby the mind of this charming barnaby was never idle and even in the short interval which had passed since the moment when she first fully conceived his project such a varied multitude of reasons had crowded one over the other into her active brain in favour of it that she was by this time quite as well pleased by the notion as himself many minor details however remained to be settled before they could act upon it but these were all discussed with the most laughing good humour and such a multitude of droll lively things were said on both sides that it may be doubted if they had ever enjoyed each other's conversation more since the first happy hour of confidence at clifton when the major related the history of his former life the great question seemed to be whether major allen's transmutation into mr o'donagough should precede his departure from the colony or follow it in all letters to england it was of course to be immediate and it was easy enough to desire that all answers should be directed under cover to mr or mrs somebody but how were they to explain to their south welsh friends this singular metamorphosis if they decided upon its taking place immediately and what were they to say to their little daughter about it if they put off this alteration of her name and family till she was old enough to ask questions about it 
besides who could answer for it as her mother very judiciously observed that the little angel might not tell tales on the other side of the water without intending to do any more harm than a playful lambkin when it says ba hush said major allen holding up his forefinger as a signal that he desired silence his wife obeyed and they both were silent for at least five minutes he then altered his position in his chair setting an elbow firmly on each arm of it and fixing his eyes steadfastly on his fair lady's face delivered himself of the valuable result of these five minutes cogitation in a tone as decided and free from all the weak vacillations of doubt as if he had been listening to the voice of an oracle during the interval my dear love said he the thing lies in a nutshell you will find upon looking through a box of papers left by the late mr o'donagough a testamentary paper by which he bequeaths to you a small landed property in the south of ireland i say the south of ireland dearest because if the acquisition produces no visible alteration in our manner of living nobody will be surprised at it a small landed property in the south of ireland but bequeathed upon the condition that any husband whom you shall marry as well as all children whom you may have shall take and bear the name and arms of o'donagough the said estate to be forfeited if the said conditions be not complied with within one year after the bequest is claimed if you will leave me for a few minutes my dear i think i shall be able to find this document these last words were accompanied by a smile which brought the major's left moustache very nearly to the off corner of his left eye a conjunction of features that denoted a most happy and facetious frame of mind mrs major allen replied by a laughing and intelligent nod but said you must let me finish this beautiful bit of hot buttered toast first my dear i have almost burnt my eyes out to do it i remember the time major and not so very long ago either when it was no less a person than mrs general hubert this identical grand lady that we read of at court who knelt down before my fire to do this job for me mercy on me to be sure who ever would have thought of poor sophy's girl coming to the wife of a general and presented at court and what if you please is to prevent our girl from doing as well i'll answer for it she will be ten times handsomer than that pale-faced agnes ever was all she had in the world for her was her youth and her eyes i ask anybody to look at our martha's eyes and say if they don't beat those of agnes out and out and as to the article of youth which by the by i do think is very necessary to the making a really great match as to that you know my dear it will be our own fault if we do not let her begin early enough most assuredly was the satisfactory reply upon which the lady stood up swallowed her last mouthful in that attitude and with another sprightly nod prepared to leave the room stay one moment dearest said the major do you happen my love to have any of the late mr o'donagough's handwriting by you oh yes lots of it he was a great writer you know do you think you have got his signature dear most likely love i will go and rummage his old writing-desk so saying mrs major allen left the room and in a very few minutes returned to it with a handful of m s s here are all sorts here said she and a bushel more if you want them upstairs with plenty of signatures amongst them here's a sermon look and here's a calculation of odds about some horse-race he was such a queer man poor o'donagough i shall always think he was half mad very likely love there lay them down that will do perfectly well now you may go and write your letter if you will while i look through these papers in search of the document you know and now leaving major allen at one writing-table we must follow his lady to another the last letter mrs major allen had addressed to her niece agnes was from the fleet prison she remembered this and smiled mercy on me she exclaimed in muttered soliloquy what a deal has happened to us both since then little hussy she was then in the very best of her bloom and she made the most of it i suspect she was quite right in not coming to me ten to one she would have lost the proud colonel if she had and it is just because i see she is up to a thing or two that i will take the trouble of writing to her now little fox she was deep as deep and i don't think her aunt barnaby was such a very great fool either now then miss agnes let us see if i can't come round you if it answers if i can contrive to make her grandee ship useful to my girl 
i know who will be the cleverest yet now for it then my dearest agnes i am not quite sure about that calling her by her name at first setting off agnes agnes thou art mine as the song says but that will only put her in mind of fifty things that it would be just as well she should forget i'll begin again my dearest niece i will not believe that the three short years which have passed since we parted can have sufficed to make you forget the nearest blood relation that you have in the world for unless a grandmother is nearer to us than a mother which i am sure no one in the world can think a real aunt your own dear mother's own sister must be nearer to you as a relation than all the aunt betsy's in the world let her be ever so rich agnes having proceeded thus far mrs major allen put her pen into the ink-bottle and there let it remain while she read and re-read this exordium yes that will do thought she that is just the right way to bring in her christian name familiarly then she resumed her pen and went on it would give me more pleasure in my distant home than anything else in the world if you my dear sister's own child would just give me a line now and then to tell me how you are going on and above all things whether you are as happy as i wish you to be short as the interview was it was a great pleasure to me to have got a sight of your dear father oh agnes how the sound of his voice did put me in mind of times gay happy times my dear child before you were born pray give my kindest sisterly love to him and tell him that he would do me the very greatest favour in the world if he would only write a few lines to me i am sure that if he will but turn a thought back to his pretty pretty sophie when she used to sing to him so sweetly he will not have the heart to refuse me i am sure my dear niece that you will be glad to hear that i am very happy and fortunate in my last marriage and moreover that at length you have a little cousin born a beautiful little girl she is i must say though to be sure a mother's judgment is apt to be partial but i really do think if you were to see your little cousin agnes you could not help being very fond of her she is so very clever and intelligent besides being so particularly beautiful that everybody who sees her takes notice of it i have called her martha after myself and my dear mother who was your grandmother you know my dear agnes god knows if circumstances will ever enable myself and my truly excellent husband to return to our native land i fear indeed that the chance is a very remote one but it would be a happy moment for me if i could show you and your dear father my child can't you fancy agnes what a pleasure it would be for me but it is no good to think about it at least for a great many years yet so many indeed that she would no longer be a little child you too my dear agnes may perhaps be a mother also if so you will be the better understanding my feelings about my darling little girl i enclose you a lock of its dear little hair by which you will see that it is as dark as mine and that already it curls naturally like yours though we are so many miles asunder i hope you will think of me and your little cousin sometimes i am sure she will be brought up to think often of you my excellent husband who is decidedly a person of the first consideration in the colony sends his affectionate compliments and his blessing to you and yours and with every good wish my beloved agnes for yourself and all who are dear to you i remain ever and for ever your most affectionate aunt martha o'donagough she was in the act of folding this letter when her husband entered the room he too had been far from idle and held in his hand the proof of it i have found the document my love said he with his smiling moustache here it is i shall immediately go and show it to everybody i know in the town and shall tell them that though i am by no means sanguine as to our ever deriving any benefit from the little out-of-the-way bit of property bequeathed by it i am nevertheless determined that our darling child shall lose nothing by any folly or indifference of mine i shall let them all know the authorities and all that henceforth for the sake of the chance it may give my dear little one i shall never call or sign myself by any other name than that of o'donagough this is a capital notion of mine depend upon it in many ways i really think it is said his wife examining the papers he had laid before her but good gracious major how very like you have made it look to poor o'donagough's writing 
i do declare i could no more tell them apart than i could fly how very clever you must be with your pen the major put his hand before his mouth caressed his moustache but said nothing and now read my letter to mrs general hubert will you major and tell me what you think of it you must leave off calling me major my darling remember that said the gentleman that will be difficult at first my dear replied the lady but i dare say i shall be perfect enough at it before the time comes for our going to england but do pray read my letter without further delay he did so and most cordially expressed his approbation the devil is in it my barnaby said he giving her a very hearty kiss if we cannot between us contrive to sail before the wind why here is a touch that is worthy of old talleyrand himself this blessing i mean that i send them down here in the corner of course i did not forget my dear that you were the reverend mr o'donagough when i introduce you to my family at parting it won't do to forget that you know upon my soul you are an angel he exclaimed and i do not believe the whole earth could furnish another woman to suit me as admirably as you do End of chapter three chapter four of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four old acquaintance and new ones paternal wisdom and maternal folly as generally displayed in well-regulated households a good-natured venture prophetic warnings disregarded parental pride and parental hopes on the other side of the world preparations for a homeward voyage it was at an unusually late breakfast-table one bright morning in the very height of the london season with windows opening upon berkeley square and letting in through their venetian blinds so rich an odour of mignonette as to make the heat and dust without forgotten that general hubert and his lady were discussing the brilliant party of the evening before when the postman's speaking disyllabic signal gave notice of the arrival of a letter from aunt betsy i am very sure exclaimed the lady from your sister with a few more raptures about calabria said the gentleman their suspense was not of long duration the silver salver addressed itself to the fair hands of agnes who took from it a letter bearing most decidedly neither an italian nor a devonshire postmark who in the world is that from said general hubert heaven knows it is excessively dirty replied his wife it is a ship letter observed the general but the postmark illegible answered agnes and then having like many other wise people wasted a little more time in examining the interior of her despatch than it would probably take to read it she broke the seal and looked within the delicate cheek of mrs hubert was instantly mantled with a bright blush whoever your correspondent may be agnes said the general meeting the distressed expression of her eye with a look of surprise he has no reason to complain of your indifference indifference she exclaimed no not indifference but how hubert will you endure even upon paper the reappearance of my aunt barnaby your aunt barnaby replied the general with a smile never mind agnes she will not harm us now oh thank heaven cried his wife fervently if you can bear it so philosophically hubert i shall declare presently that i am glad to hear from her especially by a very way-worn distant dated ship letter my love he replied laughing but if the request be not indiscreet for kindness sake read it aloud she did so and the general's commentary was far from unfriendly i declare to you agnes said he that i am very glad indeed to hear so good an account of her thank you a thousand times my own dear hubert said agnes stretching out her hand to him if you had looked at sight of this epistle as i have seen you look in days of yore at sight of herself i should have been oh i won't say how unhappy because poor foolish woman what she says is true she is my own mother's sister and though though she is or at least was all that i believe you thought of her it would have made me sorry almost as i could now be for anything that did not absolutely interfere with my own dear menage had you wished me not to answer it but you will let me answer it dear husband will you not poor thing only fancy her having a child hubert what will it be like very like herself i dare say agnes replied general hubert laughing that is you know excepting all this 
indicating the well-remembered rouge and ringlets by an expressive flourish of his fingers around his face such finished charms cannot appear at once and indeed i should not be at all surprised if miss martha o'donagough were to turn out a very bright-eyed little beauty nay i trust she will or my poor aunt will break her heart i cannot say i have a very distinct recollection of the papa have you not the least in the world and yet i shall never forget their entree how incomparably well your father behaved i assure you it was a lesson which i hope if the good lady were actually to appear before us in person i should not forget it was the most gentle and gentlemanly reproof to our beloved aunt betsy's severity that ever i witnessed and i am rather proud to confess agnes that notwithstanding my very strong inclination at the time to sympathize with the harsher faction i felt that he was right then and have decidedly loved him the better for it ever since if ever there was a perfect began agnes raising her beautiful eyes to the face of her husband but the sentiment or opinion she was about to pronounce was lost to the world for ever by the general's very unceremoniously closing her lips with a kiss we are despicably late this morning said he on looking at his watch after perpetrating this audacity and i must go to the horse guards about young belmont but let me see my boy first agnes whatever emotions the lady might feel on being thus unceremoniously treated they were not such as to induce her to refuse his request the proper signal was given and two young things entered the apartment one carried in the nurse's arms and the other dawdling before her whose aspect might really have excused if anything could the vehement fanaticism of mrs elizabeth compton concerning them as well as some undeniable symptoms of weakness on the part of general hubert himself that their mother should be firmly persuaded that no children in any degree approaching within reach of a comparison with them ever did or ever could exist is a circumstance of too constant occurrence to merit an observation but the little boys were in truth very pretty children and it was no unpardonable vanity which made their mamma exclaim as they entered i really should like for aunt barnaby mrs o'donagough i mean i really should like for her to see them hubert but perhaps if her little girl is in another style she might hardly thank me for showing them to her silly woman silly woman said the brave general going on all fours to accept the challenge of his first-born to a game of romps don't you know better than that yet why your sister nora thinks her little flaxen-headed dolls quite as handsome as either montague or compton you are quite mistaken i assure you general hubert she neither does nor could think any such thing the little stevensons are charming children beautiful little creatures but good morning agnes cried her laughing husband springing up from his station on the carpet don't finish the sentence but just tell me if aunt barnaby herself could be more preposterous in her estimate of our young van diemen's land cousin than you are of these young gentlemen nonsense montague you don't deserve to look at them let compton alone if you please sir i do not choose to have his cap taken off i know how i could revenge myself general for your impertinence i should be perfectly justified in shutting your two sons up for a month where you could by no device obtain a sight of them how do you think you should bear it general montague hubert it would be a prodigious relief my love let it be all arranged before i return said he kissing his hand as he retreated towards the door away with you dull jester replied his wife but ere he had passed the door she added stay one moment though and speak seriously if you can have you really no objection to my answering my aunt's letter most certainly not indeed i should be sorry if you did not answer it for it would not be acting like yourself my agnes answer it by all means and join my name with yours in the expression of all civility then i will write directly poor aunt barnaby only think of her sending me this lock of her baby's hair i think i must send her a scrap of these bright chestnut ringlets in return continued the young mother twisting the silken curls of the eldest boy round her fingers take care how you use your shears upon that head dear love replied the general in an accent of considerable alarm silly man silly man retorted the laughing agnes don't you know better than that yet no seriously agnes jesting apart i should not like to have you cut a monstrous cantle out of these most dainty tresses which are as like your own as it is possible for infant tresses to be and that is the reason you would not have them cut oh you false flatterer replied his wife 
besides to say the truth rejoined general hubert putting aside her admonitory finger i really think agnes you might hit upon something more welcome in the way of a dutiful niece like offering than a bit of this newly spun silk your aunt used to love a fine gown if i were you i would make a shipment to sydney of sundry owls of rich satin or velvet or something of that kind are you in earnest montague i should really like to do so very much indeed i am in earnest your father is coming to dine with us to-day let him see mrs o'donagough's letter and i dare say his heart will be moved to comply with her petition about writing and perhaps to send her a coral and bells for her daughter into the bargain after this conversation it will be readily believed that such a packet was dispatched from berkeley square to sydney as threw mrs o'donagough allen no longer into a perfect state of ecstasy on receiving it now my dear may o'donagough i mean with her eyes blazing up again with all the renovated brightness of youth now what do you think of the chance of our martha's presentation you talk of saving and saving and scraping a few pounds together and it is all vastly well as far as it goes but what will it amount to in point of advantage to our daughter compared to her being presented at court by mrs general hubert i trust o'donagough you are now sensible of the benefit we are likely to derive from the notice and affection of my family this is an extremely handsome dress my dear there is no doubt of it replied the ci-devant major you will look perfectly divine in green velvet and your brother-in-law mr willoughby has really acted with great politeness and attention in sending this handsome frock and coral ornaments for the child it all speaks well both for the wealth and goodwill of the parties you must answer these letters punctually of course and we may find out some little production of the country that will not cost much to send in return i am quite aware my dear very perfectly aware i assure you of the possible value of your connections by the way did not that dashing gay young stephenson whose fortune they said was a great deal larger than his elder brother's did not you tell me that he has married another niece of yours not exactly a niece major here her husband seized mrs o'donagough rather suddenly by the wrist and stopping short her speech said bad habits are bad things mrs o'donagough you must madam immediately cease your foolish trick under the circumstances your incredibly foolish trick of calling me major don't oblige me to remind you of it again if you please it is no child's play we are upon remember that i could make up my mind in five minutes not to care a straw about your stiff-backed cousins from one end of the list to the other but if i do for the advantage of the child and to oblige you if i do determine to give myself the trouble of getting amongst them it must be done in a manly decided business-like spirit and in a style that may hereafter enable me to turn it to account mrs o'donagough do you understand me yes to be sure i do she replied disengaging her arm by a stout tug you need not claw one in that way i am not a bit more likely to spoil a good scheme than yourself mr alias o'donagough the ci devant major looked as black as thunder he liked not this sportive phrase it grated painfully on his ear and it was not till he had twice paced the length of the room that he felt able to renew the conversation at length however he said and apparently with recovered good humour this is silly work my love squabbling about which of us is capable of carrying on the war with the most skill i don't believe we should either of us prove deficient if we were fairly tried and that it is likely enough we shall be and on a very handsome scale too if we ever really get launched among the people you talk of i can assure you my barnaby that to a man like me it is a devilish bore to be kept fiddle-faddling amongst such a set as there are here come let us talk em all over a little first there's that giant of a general he is just the sort of man i take it to make a great bluster beforehand and then be led by the nose by his wife when she has caught him so if you contrive to keep well with your niece he won't be much in the way then there's that sort of a wandering jew of a man that you told me such a long story about agnes's father he is come home isn't he as rich as a nabob he did not enter into any particulars my dear donny but he said something about being at last in comfortable circumstances if i remember rightly and i am sure no poor man could have sent out such a present as he has done to patty well then that's all right but i'll tell you who it is that i reckon most upon in this affectionate family reunion that you promise me 
for the truth is i remember a little about the young fellow myself i mean stevenson the younger brother frederick stevenson i happen to know that his fortune was about half as large again as his elder brother's didn't he play sometimes i am almost sure i have heard so i don't know about that my dear but it is very likely almost all men of fashion do at last i have heard miss morrison say so over and over but if you ask because you think that one of these days you should like to play with him yourself on account of his being rich which makes it so easy for him to lose i'll answer for it there will be no difficulty about that so intimate as we shall all be together for i well remember he was the most obliging good-natured creature in the world dear me i am sure i shall never forget our famous walk to bristol when i was obliged to roll myself over and over in the dust to save my life from that beast don't you remember how excessively kind he was running back to clifton with agnes to get a carriage for me this was the first direct allusion to any of their clifton adventures which had been made since their marriage and a perceptible frown agitated the eyebrows of mr o'donagough his sharp-witted wife smiled aside as she remarked it she and her husband had been as we know vastly fond lovers but there is a process which chemically takes place when sweets to the sweet have been incautiously laid together that renders sour what before such too closely pent-up union had been altogether the reverse and it occasionally happens in married life that something analogous to this will occur mrs o'donagough was still perhaps a little on the fret and it was certainly no very sweet feeling which caused her to set down a private leaf of her memory's tablet a n b to the effect that she knew how to plague her husband when he deserved it at that moment however she willingly let the subject pass and turning again to the copious waves of green velvet which flowed from chair to chair reiterated her thankfulness that among all the other good gifts which nature and fortune had bestowed on her she possessed for a niece a mrs general hubert who knew so perfectly well how to suit her taste and dimensions in the purchase of a dress of course a correspondence so auspiciously begun was not permitted to drop by any negligence on the part of mrs o'donagough and the same good feeling which produced the first reply from berkeley square continued to dictate many more in the same kind spirit of forgetfulness as to everything that it was disagreeable to remember it is certainly possible that both the general and his sweet wife indulged in this benevolent sort of oblivion the more readily from feeling a comfortable degree of security as to the continuance of mrs o'donagough's residence abroad both knew though neither of them talked about it that it was next to impossible any man should have married the aunt barnaby from any other motive than a wish to appropriate her little fortune it therefore followed that mr o'donagough was poor and if so it was equally certain that what she possessed would not suffice to permit his leaving the new country where he could inhabit lax the paradise of corn and mutton which spread around him in order again perhaps to be jostled while in search of a dinner in the old one ergo they would stay where they were with this persuasion to sustain and stimulate their good nature aided too by the kind-hearted sympathy and co-operation of mr willoughby they continued for many years to testify their good will by letters and by gifts the expectation and reception of which formed the glory of mrs o'donagough's van diemen existence while her letters and presents in return were occasionally the source of very harmless amusement among such as remembered her mrs elizabeth compton alone must be accepted for she ceased not to declare with unvarying pertinacity and it may be with something of undying bitterness that the having half the globe between them was by no means a sufficient security against the possibility of annoyance from such a source and that nothing short of treating mrs barnaby as if civilly dead could suffice to protect them securely from the horrors of a reunion with her most cassandra like however was the fate of the old lady's pungent eloquence everybody listened to her with an incredulous smile and general hubert seemed even to enjoy the vivid picture she sometimes drew of scenes ensuing from the alarming lady's possible return she will not come aunt betsy he said but if she should where would the sting be now gone drawn and harmless for evermore can she divorce us aunt betsy do you think that likely agnes your husband is quite young enough was the old lady's reply i never in all my reading met with a stronger instance of the false reasoning of wrong-headed young love may providence keep you from this terrible woman my dear general for it is quite clear you have not wit enough to guard yourself 
think if your sufferings from a barnaby would not be increased tenfold by seeing them shared by your wife but general hubert shook his head and only laughed at her End of chapter four